SYS presents Adventures in Online Education. Welcome friends, you're listening to SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. I'm your host, Natalie Conway. Thanks for being here. Do you receive the weekly AOE newsletter? Head over to aoepodcast.org and enter your info at the bottom of the page to get a weekly update from me, including thoughts on education and notes about the latest show. It's a little piece of positivity for your inbox. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Lainey Rowell, author of Evolving Learner, podcast host, TEDxer, international consultant, experienced teacher, and district leader. She's one of us, an online educator, and she has a practical and insightful perspective on education and teaching. Lainey was a contributor to the 2019 National Standards for Quality Online Teaching and on the 2014 Blended Learning Teacher Competency Framework Committee. Today, we talk about facing challenges with positivity and sharing control over our classrooms with students. You're really going to love Lady. So, you ready? Let's learn something new. Hi, Lainey Rowell. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Natalie. I am so excited to talk about Evolving Learner today and dive into a couple of really cool ideas that I think not only um, online teachers, but all teachers will really benefit from hearing. But will you give our audience a little bit of context? Who are you? What are you doing in the field of education these days? Yeah, so I am in my 25th year of education, and I have done a variety of things. I was obviously a classroom teacher, an online teacher. I've been district office. Uh, I am currently a consultant, and my biggest client is Orange County Department of Ed. I'm also doing a lot of writing, and I speak regularly, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's the big stuff. <laughs> you do a lot and it's so cool. I'm very excited to talk to you and because you are an online educator yourself. So you 100% understand what our audience is living through day to day and how they work and how they operate and what really matters to them. So I'm excited for them to hear your perspective and your really cool new ideas. So let's dive in. You know, we face unique challenges when we are in a virtual school setting. I'm not necessarily talking about remote learning. I'm talking about legitimate online, purposefully online education. And one of those challenges is engagement, both student and family engagement. And hard, it's hard to reach someone who does not acknowledge your emails or does not answer your phone calls. But there's also so much room for growth, so much room for positive outcomes. You talk about teachers facing what we call problems of practice. What is a problem of practice and how can online teachers specifically go about tackling those? So basically what a problem of practice is, is it's it's identifying a focus. It's saying, okay, this is something that I can work on that is tied to the instructional core. It's observable. Um, it can be improved in real time. It's like within my control. And if I if I am able to do this, it's going to make a significant difference. It's going to really help our kids. And so I think as educators, we are overwhelmed with a lot. And it's really hard to pick a focus, but it's also incredibly important to pick that focus. Absolutely. And I really see engagement as one of those that it does focus on our instructional core because if students aren't engaged with it, we can't get them connected to our to our instruction. We can observe in different ways in the online setting how they are or are not engaged. And hopefully it's something we could improve in real time and, and that would make a significant difference for students. Do you have any examples of problems of practice that you've worked through? Um, so... One that I've been hearing a lot about lately has to do with kind of assessment and feedback. Yes. And so Katie Novak, yeah, it's a tough one, right? Um, it's something, you know, Katie Novak has this really cool, uh, it's funny, I said cool, 
sentence starter. It's very simple. And it's just, it would be cool if, and so that's another way to frame your problem of practice. So, you know, I would say it would be cool if learners took the actionable feedback that I gave them to improve their work, because that's something that can be very frustrating as teachers is that we spend a lot of time, you know, giving high quality feedback, we make it actionable, but it's for some reason, nothing's translating into improved work. And so how do we make that happen? So I'm always trying to look upstream, like what are the barriers? What is making it so that kids, for whatever reason, are not wanting to or not feeling the need to make the improvements that we're suggesting, right? Yes. And so I, I, I think there's some some interesting ways to approach this. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that it's Christy Loudon, she has a post on cult of pedagogy called withhold the grade. I hope I got that right, but it's, that's the idea, right? So, so the idea is, is that you are, they're going to do their, for let's say writing, for example, they're going to do their first draft. You're going to conference with them, give them feedback in some way, but you're not going to actually give them a grade yet because a lot of times, not, I'm not going to say for every kid, but for a lot of kids, once you put the grade on it, it feels final and it doesn't feel like there's a reason to keep going with it. Now, you might get the kids who are highly motivated by grades and they're like, well, I'm not going to take a B. I'm going to go for that A. Um, but you'll you'll definitely get some kids who are like, B, solid. I can move right? on. Right, yes. So, <laughs> so it's kind of thinking about, okay, well, what is it that I – can do so they don't think that when I give this back to them with feedback that we're done like how do I promote them continuing in this iterative process and so I'm always trying to think like that so I think I withhold the grade is probably one of my go-to strategies it's not the only way but it's a way that I find to be pretty helpful yes and we just had Natalie Varda Basso on the podcast a couple episodes ago and she talked about just that delaying the grade if at all possible because of that feeling a student might get that is tied to self-esteem or just like you said, effort even. Okay. Hey, be good enough. Let's move on. You know, and that's not yeah. necessarily our goal when we're assessing and evaluating it's feedback that we, we want to see improvement. So totally understand that. And I think, and it's hard. I try to be, and you're right, delay the grade. I think I said something else, but that is the the name of the article. So I, I think language does matter and we have to be careful in the way that we say things to kids so that we're not also making it sound like this isn't important to iterate on. We have to be encouraging them. And I think we need to model that through our own actions as I'm a continuous learner, you're a continuous learner, we're all continually improving. Absolutely. And I really like that phrase from Katie Novak, it would be cool if, because we can apply that to our professional practice and then to our work with students as well. I just feel like you can you can use that phrase in so many contexts and it turns your problem into something that you're going to work towards solving and it also helps you reframe it in a little bit more positive of a light. You know, it would be cool if I could connect more effectively with with parents or it would be cool if I could figure out how to get more books in my kids' hands at their homes, you know. So you're already starting to think uh, in solutions oriented ways rather than just lamenting the problem. Exactly. <laughs> lamenting the problem. Exactly. So you mentioned engagement earlier. And so one thing that I would offer to teachers, because when I'm stuck on something, my go-to is to ask our kids what they would do. Ooh. So you could actually put that to kids and say, okay, here's, here's the challenge we're having. Um, I'm not seeing enough engagement here. I need you to finish this sentence stem for me. It would be cool if, and put it on them to give some suggestions. And you'd be surprised. You might get something like, it would be cool if we started our synchronous session with music playing, or it would be cool if we had an opportunity to explore content before we actually did the direct instruction. So I feel more confident. We under, I mean, I'm so guilty of it underestimating my own children, <laughs> the ones I have at home, uh, kids, like I have to constantly remind myself, ask the kids to help. This is us, not just me, not just Yes, them. that's brilliant. That's really wise and really honoring your students as individuals, as learners, as humans. It would be cool if 
they tell they tell you. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's sit with that idea for a minute. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to kind of continue with that idea and talk about ownership and sharing ownership um student directed versus teacher directed and how to kind of find a good balance there. So stay tuned. SYS is an online management company that takes a different approach. We partner with schools to manage solutions. Whether you are a district adding an online option for students or an online school looking to go in a new direction, SYS Education can help make it exactly what you need it to be with high quality products at a fraction of the cost that schools pay to other companies. We are not just an educational consulting company, we are online educators ourselves and a tech team like no other. Let us help you bring your online school experience to the next level. Find out more at syseducation.org or by emailing info at syseducation.org. Set up your free consultation meeting to discuss how SYS might be able to help your school. All right, welcome back. We are talking to Lainey Rowell about evolving learners, and we're diving into a new question now about ownership of learning. That's a point of tension for all teachers, including online educators. The teacher needs to address certain common core state standards, but students' interests may lead us in other directions, and we want to be able to see their thinking and see their work, but we can't control every breakout room or every synchronous learning environment. So what advice, Lainey, would you give to someone looking to strike the right balance of teacher versus student-driven learning? Okay, so the big picture for me would be I have... As part of my background as an online teacher, look to the community of inquiry as a framework to help me think about the big picture. So we've got our social presence, our teaching presence, and the cognitive presence. So I'm always trying to think about, okay, so how am I managing the the social presence? And that's one that I'm obviously going to get into very quickly in the beginning of the year because we're trying to build that community, right? Essential, yeah. It's essential. Absolutely. Um, We need them to feel like this is a community so that they want to be a part of it, not just something that they do Monday at three o'clock. And the other thing is teacher presence. So at the very beginning of the year, I'm super focused. I'm focused all year, but hyper focused on teaching presence and the social presence. So the how are they um, working interpersonal with each other? And then how am I inserting myself? How am I showing them I'm there? I use the word relentless a lot. Like I'm calling, I'm emailing, I'm sending surveys at the beginning of the year. How do you like to be communicated with? What's the best way to um, talk to your family? That kind of stuff. So I'm really trying to to focus in on that. And then the, the cognitive presence, you know, when we have the social presence, when we have the teacher presence, you know, how do we co-construct knowledge and meaning through inquiry? And so that's kind of like the big picture. I hope that, that made, made sense. great sense. I have a nice, I have a nice visual that I know we, it doesn't work well in podcasts, but <laughs> Maybe we'll put um, that in the show notes then for our listeners. That would be awesome. So of course I didn't come up with a cog- uh, uh, community of inquiry, but um, it's, it's a framework that's been around for a long time and it's something that I really go to. So that there's three, it's funny, there's a lot of threes in my world. And so another threes would be the three Ds. And I know that you had my very good friend, Stephanie Rothstein on here to talk about. Yes, yeah, she was on last season. So if, if anyone wants to check that out, just go back to season one. It was awesome, really enlightening. So Stephanie is an expert on design thinking. We happened to connect with each other at a conference and she saw me talking about the three Ds and we decided to partner up and write an article for Edutopia. So that was really, really helpful. But what what is really powerful to me about the three Ds, and I'll, I'll say them hopefully a couple of times for the listeners. So it's discover, discuss, and demonstrate. If you're familiar with the five E's, it's in alignment with that. It is very different from a traditional lesson design. Even if you go to the I do, we do, you do, it's basically flipping that. And so I want to show or I want to give opportunities for learners to have choice, which is for me a huge hallmark and cornerstone of online learning is the voice and choice. 
That's it's it's so big. It's so big. It's, so it's big. why kids come online in a lot of ways. It's why students choose and families choose to make that huge dramatic shift to online education. Yes, it's the moving away from compliance to learner driven. So from so that's just that's just my take on it. So when we design for inquiry, we're not saying and and I'll give you a very, you know, I said the I do, we do, you do, you know, if you were to go to a traditional lesson design, anticipatory set, direct instruction, guided practice, it's always about starting from the teacher. Mm. And to me, I don't need to always be the focal point at the beginning of learning. I actually want to not be the focal point. I want to have created the environment for everyone to thrive. So so that discover, putting that first, is where I'm giving options over pace and path. And in online, they get the choice over place already. We already know that, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right. Some, some choice, right? <laughs> um, so if I'm doing a lesson on, let's say, life cycles or something, is there a video that they could watch? Is there an infographic that they could explore? Is there a piece of text that they could read? And I give them these. In the beginning, it's a da- you know um, gradual release of responsibility. So in the beginning, I tend to be giving them options. As I teach them and I'm cultivating expert learners, they can also find resources and they don't have to rely on me. But I am going to scaffold that. So, you know, they can watch the video of the the butterfly life cycle that's time lapsed. They can take some time to look at the infographic. Maybe they're going to do all three of them. They're doing this asynchronously because I want them to come to a comfort level where they're ready to, when we get together, discuss. So they discover, discuss. Now that discuss might be some direct instruction, might be a mini lesson, and then we do some talk, or maybe there's an online discussion board. Um... And then demonstrate, it always sounds funny to put it at the end because it's definitely not at the end. There's demonstrating all the way. And you mentioned breakout rooms earlier. So I try to be really strategic with if I'm doing a breakout room, what's the accountability piece that I can build into it? Maybe there's a slide, a Google slide deck where I say, okay, well, breakout room two, this is your, your slide in the slide deck. And I can see every slide as they're doing it. So I'm, I know which breakout room I need to pop into is like breakout room slides five is blank. What is happening <laughs> right. in this room? Something is missing here. I'm going to hop in and help out. I'm going to, so I strategically pick which room I'm going to go into. And then maybe they just needed a like, oh, for some reason we couldn't get it loaded on our screen. Okay. Well, I can help them with that. Maybe they didn't have the link for some reason. I don't know. But I'm just going to be really um, careful about where I put my time while they're in their breakout rooms. Because what I, unfortunately, breakout room is not a break for me. It doesn't mean I hang out in the main room. (laughs) Right. Just you in the main room for the purposes of recording, smiling. (laughs) Drinking my coffee. No, that's not what, for me, the breakout rooms are my small group time. That's like my synchronous small group time. So so that's what I really love about that. So, so yeah, so discover, discuss, demonstrate. So on the high level, it's the community of inquiry. That's the big picture. And then what I'm definitely trying to do on the day-to-day basis is, okay, how can I move myself out of the start How can I let them take the initiative? And that's really neat because you're going to have that discuss, maybe go in a different direction if they are doing the discovery rather than you sharing the discovery with them. That's going to really make it more student-driven, student-directed, and who knows where it might go. Do you kind of put bumpers in there a little bit? Is there some guidance that happens or parameters that are set? So it I kind of depend. So I find graphic organizers are really helpful for keeping kind of even with adults I have found this because I've done cycles of inquiry with adults where if I if I don't give the adult learner a graphic organizer to kind of stay um on on focus, it can really go sideways pretty fast. So graphic designers are really helpful also and I know I'm kind of speaking generally about this, but you know, is the 3Ds like what part of the 3 is what part of the D's are going to be synchronous versus asynchronous. So I could do the three D's. I could do the entire thing in a synchronous session with station rotations and 
hopefully I have some evidence, some data that I can use where I go, okay, because I'm going to hop through all of these stations, I am going to group these kids intentionally and I am going to start with this group who I think is going to need more scaffolding and I'm going to get them on the right foot before they go and discover because they might just need a little more guidance and then I, and then they're going to go to discuss and demonstrate and of course I can keep popping back at it but I'm trying to figure out how I can do the small group time so that's like if I want to get it all into one synchronous session or maybe over a few days because it could just you know take more than just a few minutes in a in a station rotation mm-hmm. and then the other way to do it is to think about like I mean you could honestly do the whole three D's asynchronously too right because totally it could could. be that you have you have your content your discover content and I've seen teachers do this in their learning management system they've got their discover section and then the discuss is an online discussion board mm-hmm. and then their demonstrate is you know this is the assignment that you're going to turn into me so. There's just so many ways to do it. And I think it's really fun to think about, okay, well, you know what? I actually want the discover to be asynchronous, but I want the discuss to be synchronous. And then I want the discover or the demonstrate to be asynchronous. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Like I kind of nerd out on the variation. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like they are endless. And you could really go with your classes collective strengths, especially at the start. Maybe they are super quiet in the discussion boards and they don't really engage in that yet. So you'll do it in live class instead, or maybe they are crickets in live class and they're still shy and getting to know each other and they'll do better with the asynchronous discussion board, that kind of thing. I can absolutely see that happening or just using it to your student's strengths. And then I liked your idea around intentionally grouping students as well if you're going to try to do it all in one shot or all synchronously i think that is really sensical these are great ideas and you said something oh i appreciate that you said something if i could really quickly you said something that was i thought so important about kind of learning the preferences of your Mm. students and you know what are their personalities like and it's it's going to be probably different. We know, you know, variability is the rule, not the exception. And so to that's one of the things that I feel like we do really well in online learning is we honor those who thrive in the synchronous, but we also honor those who thrive in the asynchronous. So, you know, giving those options where, okay, yes, we're going to do some synchronous discussion where the kids who are going to speak up are going to just shine, but what is the opportunity to share their thinking asynchronously for the kids who need a little more time to process, who want to think about it with empathy and just be super intentional and just have more time? Absolutely. And we have so much flexibility in the online setting to do that. No matter what platform or LMS you're using, there is that flexibility to, you know, pop the class recording in here and put it in the discussion or put it in the page or whatever it might be and share that so it's available in both of those ways. And obviously we have our flexibility with grading and points and all of that as well that you don't even have to have it worth points or you can be delaying assigning credit for things. So there just seem to be a lot of possibilities around those three Ds of discover, discuss, and demonstrate. And I also liked what you said about demonstrate happening the whole time. It's not necessarily just the end product or the end thing or action that the student performs. It's happening that whole time. And so it isn't just I do, and then I'm not doing anything and you're doing it. And that, you know, it's it's moving away from that model, which really challenges us as educators and practitioners and maybe makes our classes a bit more fun and engaging along the way. Yeah. And I, and I just want to reiterate that my go-to is, uh, you know, how can I learn from my kids? How can I have them help me think through solutions? Because I feel like there's something in us teachers that we want so much to help every single child. And that is so good. But sometimes the best help we can do is to empower them and also step out of the way. And so it's hard, but, you know, giving them the voice to share, like, this is my thinking. This is what I think would work well here. Um, 
it's, it's hard. The hardest thing for me to do whenever ever I'm leading anything, whether it's with adults or kids, is to stop talking. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to do. It's true. If, if anyone out there is a parent, I think you've probably felt that same thing where you want to protect and you want to put all the bumpers in place and you want to make it safe and perfect. And life isn't. And so just giving kids the tools they need and letting them letting them show themselves that they can do more than they think they can or that they are more capable and they have more bravery inside them than they maybe realize. And that it's going to be okay, too, if it doesn't go as planned or it doesn't come out exactly how they wanted it to. That's okay. And nothing dramatic or bad happened as a result. I think those are really good learning experiences, too, just being able to put yourself out there a little bit and share an idea and see it get maybe rejected or refined by a classmate and learn to be okay with that and and move forward. I think that's really important too. I have one more question for you before I let you go about your multiple jobs today. (laughs) You included a C.S. Lewis quote in one of your recent presentations to educators, and it says, the fellow pupil can help more than the master because he knows less. The difficulty we want him to explain is one he has recently met. The expert met it so long ago, he has forgotten. But tell us how this relates to that feedback and to empowering learners and evolving what we're doing with learners. Well, I think regardless of your setting for teaching, I think we've all had this experience where we have explained a concept and we we just nailed it. Like no one has ever taught this thing better than we <laughs> just did. Like, wow, amazing. Um, and then we do some sort of check for understanding and people aren't getting it. And we're like, I don't understand. It can't be done better than what I just did. And it's like, well, you know it so well, you'll never understand that struggle. You, It just makes so much sense to you. And you genuinely could have done the best job ever of explaining it. But when we allow peers to work with each other, that's really powerful because they have that proximity to learning. They were just in the struggle. They've overcome it. And now because they know what that's like, so recently, they're going to do a better job. And there's also just a factor of kid language. Um, it's just, yes. I, 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 Lainey, who learned it five seconds ago, am going to use different words than Natalie, who's known it for a very, very long time. So when I turn and talk to my neighbor, I'm going to be like, oh, so you know what we're saying here is, and and it's going to be potentially more accessible to the learner who's not getting it. So that peer-to-peer, there's a really beautiful model by Eric Mazur called Peer Instruction. And what it is, is there is a little bit of direct instruction, or maybe you play a video or something like that. And then, and I won't do it justice, but if you go to my website, laneyrowell.com, and you go to the resources tab, um, I have I have tons of presentations and I talk about Eric Mazur. In fact, it's in the one, it should be in the one, Natalie, that you're referring to that you were going to share. So excellent. It's in there. So, but the key is, is that I don't, I mean, I, I don't think this is something online teachers tend to do, so don't get me wrong, but don't lecture without doing anything else for like 50 minutes. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, I really, with all due respect, please, I, even if you are the, you know, the best lecturer in the world, please don't lecture for just 50 minutes. So what you would do is you do a mini lecture and then you do a check for understanding. You'd pull the group basically. And then based on the data, you can decide when they should talk to each other, when you should try and reteach it versus when should you move on. So it's 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 actually like a beautiful mathematical thing that if like 75% of the kids are getting it right, don't spend any more time on it. You'll have some data using the whatever tool you're using to do that check for understanding. You'll have some data about who you need to maybe pull for a small group um, if necessary, but don't spend any more class time whole group on that. That's a waste of time. Then if 30% or less are getting it, like, you've got to do something different. There's, like, not enough knowledge within the group. Don't have them talk to each other. They could actually make it worse. (laughs) Yeah, good consideration. It's like, oh, no. But there's this sweet spot, and it's basically the the research that Dr. Mazur came came to concluded that it's like 31% to 74%. Basically, in that middle, there's enough knowledge within the group that if you were to, say, put them in a breakout room and have them justify their answers to each other, 
the kids who are getting it, sheer reasoning, they're going to be able to explain it to the kids who aren't. And it's like, they just came to it, most likely. They're going to use their kid language and explain to their peers. And then you bring them out of the breakout room, you repoll. And what I always find is at least 10 to 20% in gains, sometimes more. So wow. they're going to help each other, right? So That's empowering too for, for both the student who's maybe having a misunderstanding and the student who just had the aha. That's really empowering for both of them to be able to communicate together and and collaborate in order to to understand what they're learning and then bring it back to you. That's really neat. And I, I like I, I like the numbers part of it that it's just like I don't have to like, hmm, should I spend more time on this? It's like I know. 75% or more got it. I'm not going to spend more time on this whole group. That's going to be a small group. That's going to be um, a one-on-one -on -one or something like that. So the peer instruction is just one example. Um, I think peer feedback is really important. I think I think about um, Ross Cooper and Aaron Murphy's latest book on project-based learning and inquiry and them talking about gradual release of responsibility for feedback. So I'm going to model as a teacher how to give feedback. Then it's going to be peer-to-peer -peer feedback. And then it's going to be self-assessment kind of thing, self-feedback. So I think that's important. And then the last one I just want to put out there is for the peer-to-peer um, we have this beautiful opportunity where we can give kids an opportunity to show what they know and are able to do and capture it through things like video tutorials. And yes. then, I, I mean, I'm a nerd for video tutorials. There's other ways to do it, but I'm kind of a nerd for this way because what I love to do is, and I got this from my friend Eric Marcos, he's a teacher in LA, and he would say to the kids, okay, for homework, quote unquote homework, he, he's an in-person teacher, but you all can, you all know what I mean. For your asynchronous, yep. time, <laughs> for your asynchronous time, uh, you can do this, this, um, these set of math problems and turn them into me, or you can create a video tutorial explaining one of the math problems. You only have to do one, but you're going to do a video tutorial. So what the brilliance is there is he's giving them choice. Um, when it's good, he has something that can be used to teach the other kids. He also has built a bank of thousands of videos that are never outdated, uh, that he can pull in and use in like a flipped learning or just as a, you know, opportunity for discover on your own time. He's also capturing this formative assessment because he's hearing them work through the problem. And so, so often when we just have them turn something in, we don't see the struggle, uh, we just see where it went wrong, but we don't see why it went wrong. But when we have them do a video tutorial and they're explaining, we can hear where it went wrong. And so I think that's really helpful. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, we've used Sketch Toy a lot in the past to sort of see a student's thinking, but to actually hear their voice and hear them explaining it is really beneficial. And then I love the idea of keeping those and cataloging them. I did that with my good friend Andrew Sinkowski. We used to teach high school math together online, and we had students make the notes, basically, I used to, as the SPED teacher, formulate the notes and kind of scaffold that and do a gradual release of responsibility. And then we discovered, you know, we're sending kids to Khan Academy, maybe, or another resource, but they could make those videos and speak the language that their peers are understanding and say it in a way and even really class specific, like those little phrases that a teacher comes up with or the, the way that you do class, you know? So I think that's really, really a great tool for teachers to start thinking about using this year. Those video tutorials are awesome. And you make a good point because I've had some teachers be like, I'm not, I'm, no disrespect to Sal Khan, but the way he explains it is not exactly how I would explain it. So right. you can do the direct instruction. You can explain it during your synchronous time and then give them the opportunity to go off and do that. And then now you're creating, like you said, the language that's being used within that class um, is being replicated and, but also inclusive of the kid language that makes it more accessible to the student who's struggling. So big nerd. I love it. There are so many benefits. We could go on and on. Lainey, thank you so much for your time today. How can listeners get in touch with you? How can they find your book or maybe just learn more from you? Where are you in the online world? Yes, I am lots of places, but the two places <laughs> I probably spend the most time would be Twitter and Instagram. 
Um, also Facebook, but you'll be subject to pictures of kids and family members in that one. But uh, <laughs> for, for most of my education related stuff, it's going to be um, Twitter and Facebook. So I'm at Lainey Rowell, which is a lot of spelling, L-A-I-N-I-E and then R-O-W-E-L-L. So Rowell like Powell. So at Laney Rowell, pretty much across the web. Um, you've got my website and I'm always looking to connect with people. So I hope if, if you're listening to this and you want to chat more, please don't hesitate to reach out. I would love to connect. Awesome. And I absolutely encourage our listeners to connect with Lainey. She is a fantastic, a consummate professional and really approachable, friendly, reasonable, smart woman wow. who knows what she's doing and is helping education become a better thing here in the U.S. So thank you again, Lainey. I look forward to seeing what else you end up writing this year. And we really appreciate your time today and all your great ideas. Thank you for having me. You're amazing. So happy. Thanks, Natalie. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. Special thanks to my distinguished guest today, Lainey Rowell. Lainey taught us how to harness the power of the 3Ds, how to examine problems of practice in new ways, and that sometimes the best teachers in our classrooms are our own students. Next week, I will talk with Ashley White, online educator and instructional coach, about what it looks like to coach teachers in an online school. Don't miss this insightful conversation. If you liked what you heard today, please hit subscribe and give us a rating. On Twitter, you can follow me, Natalie Conway, at AOE Natalie, and the show at SYS Presents. If you're interested in finding out more about SYS Education, head on over to syseducation.org. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our exceptional team at SYS Education, including sound engineers Natalie Farrell and Matt Duran, and producer Bo Neal. Thanks for listening, and remember, we can learn new things.